Hello, good afternoon, good morning. Today we are using uh, the interpretation function on Zoom and we will be providing simultaneous interpretation. So if you are not bilingual, English and Spanish, please follow the following instructions. After this announcement, you will see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. You will click at the globe icon and select English or Spanish. If you're joining on your cell phone using the Zoom application, please go to the bottom of your screen, click on the three dots and select uh, language interpretation, English or Spanish. Friendly reminder, please all speakers speak slow and close to your microphone to facilitate support with interpretation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sayuri. Good morning, everyone. I'm Grace Anita Ali, the curator at large for CADI. And welcome to our Curators in Conversation program, which is a series dedicated to dialogue and engagement. Curators of color committed to the Afro-Caribbean and its diaspora. Today, our focus is on Cuba with two important Cuban curatorial voices you will hear from shortly, Aldede Delgado and Suzette Sanchez. We are so thrilled to be hosting this conversation in tandem with our newly launched digital exhibition, The Abyss of the Ocean, guest curated by Aldere Delgado. And as you've probably seen, if you haven't, we'll put it in the, in the chat for you. The project is truly compelling in gathering several key Cuban women photographers, which includes Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, Coco Fusco, Marta Maria Perez Bravo, Pertrudes Rivalta, and Juana Valdez, who each engage in their own particular and unique ways with issues around migration, blackness, and the objectification of women's bodies. Before we get started, um, it's my absolute honor to welcome into our Zoom room, Caddy's Executive Director, Melody Capote, who I have to always share with you all when we do curators in conversation, is that she is the driving force behind this organization's mission to support the initiatives, elevating the voices of curators of color who are invested in the Caribbean. And I'm always grateful to have her with us. Welcome, Melody. Gracias, Grace. Hola, yo soy Melody Capote, directora ejecutiva del Centro Cultural Caribeño del Instituto de la Diáspora Africana en Nueva York. La misión del centro se enfoca en la justicia racial y social defendiendo equidad para descendientes africanos, sean como desde Puerto Rico, Haití, Cuba, Trinidad, Brasil, la República Dominicana, etc. El centro en sus 45 años de existencia ha tenido el papel de, de levantar nuestras voces usando el arte, media y cultura como las y herramientas para con, vía conferencias, conciertos, talleres, programas en las escuelas y exhibiciones como esta. El abismo del océano, fotógrafas cubanas, migraciones y la pregunta de raza alinea con el legado de nuestra organización, creando espacio, elevando la historia y genio de nuestra gente negra. Esta exhibición, eh, perdón, en esta exhibición, nos enfocamos en las expresiones artísticas de la mujer latina y validamos las experiencias individuales y co colectivas compartidas globalmente. En este momento, quiere, quiero darle las gracias a las curadoras de esta exhibición, Aldere Delgado y Grace Ali, y a las artistas María Magdalena Campos Pons, Coco Fusco, Marta María Pérez Bravo, Gertrudis Rivalta y Juana Valdés, por compartir sus visiones y cuentos articulando verdadere, verdade, verdades a lo cual ya no puede virar el ojo ciego. También quiero reconocer a nuestros panelistas de hoy, Suzette Sánchez y Jazmín Chávez Helm, y darle las gracias a nuestros intérpretes, Sayuris Gómez y Luis López. También muchas gracias al personal del centro. 
con esto los dejo ahora con Grace Ali para empezar nuestro programa. Gracias por estar con nosotros. Thank you, Melody. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you a wonderful, powerful voice in the Cuban curatorial field, our guest curator um, the, of the Abyss of the Ocean, Aldede Delgado. And Aldede is Cuban born and based in Miami. She's an independent Latinx art historian and curator and founder and director of Women Photographers International Archive, also known as WOPA. It's a fabulous organization doing impactful work for global women photographers. Before I pass it on to Aldede, who will be in conversation with our, also our featured guest, Suzette Sanchez, I just want to share with our audience watching how we'll run our program so you know what's coming up. We will hear from Aldede and Suzette Sanchez in conversation with, you, with each other about their Cuban curatorial practices and some of the important issues that they're facing. After which we will be joined by Caddy Curatorial Fellow, Hasmin Chavez-Helm, who will offer a response to the conversation. And then we will open it up to you all for your questions and your comments. So please utilize the Q&A button below. Um, during the conversation and then during the Q&A program, we'll be monitoring that and we will take your questions. And then we will conclude with closing remarks from Caddy's Director of Programs, Sabine Blaisen. And with that, I'll pass it on to Aldere. Aldere, welcome. Bueno, muchísimas gracias por la invitación a curar esta exhibición. Y también, eh, gracias, Melody, gracias a todo el equipo de Caddy por su apoyo en el diseño, la coordinación y la promoción de esta muestra. También quiero agradecer a todas las artistas eh, incluidas en la exhibición, eh, a los intérpretes que nos acompañan hoy, a todas eh, las personas que de un modo u otro han apoyado para la realización de este proyecto. Eh, gracias eh, bueno, a Suset, Jasmine, Sabine, que eh, bueno, tendrán participación en los próximos minutos. El abismo del océano, The Abyss of the Ocean, es una exposición que debe ser entendida en diálogo con dos grupos expositivos anteriores. El primero es la exposición Building a Feminist Archive, construyendo un archivo feminista, Cuban Women Photographers in the U.S. Fotógrafas Cubanas en los Estados Unidos, que curé en el año 2019. Esta exposición presentó las variadas contribuciones de artistas cubanas viviendo y trabajando en los Estados Unidos desde los años 70, cuando el concepto de una identidad latina colectiva se convirtió en un factor determinante de los movimientos políticos, culturales y sociales de la época. Beating a Feminist Archive enfocó las experiencias pluriculturales de estas artistas. Las obras raramente vistas con anterioridad o que se presentaban por primera vez en el marco de esta exposición, abordaban los temas de comunidad, activismo y resistencia como parte de un momento donde las artistas ya no solo se identificaban como cubanas, sino también asumían la identidad latina para evitar el silenciamiento de sus prácticas creativas en el contexto de los Estados Unidos. En relación con esta exposición, The Abyss of the Ocean, el abismo del océano, mantiene el interés en el marco de reflexión sobre la latinidad, pero esta vez amplía el enfoque para incluir artistas cubanas que viven en otros espacios de la diáspora como España y México. Y con ello también busco problematizar el concepto de latinidad y el lugar que los sujetos racializados han tenido en la construcción del proyecto moderno colonial de Latinoamérica y específicamente el caso de Cuba. Esta exposición presenta eh, series fotográficas producidas desde la década de 1990 por María Magdalena Campos Pons, Coco Fusco, Marta María Pérez Bravo, Gertrudis Rivalta y Juana Valdés. Las obras de estas artistas, como verán en el sitio web de, eh, del proyecto, 
expone al descubierto los matices de sus múltiples identidades diaspóricas, como es más evidente en la obra de eh, María Magdalena Campos o de Juana Valdés, eh, al tiempo que confronta la objetificación de los cuerpos de las mujeres, como vemos en la obra de Coco Fusco, Marta María Pérez Bravo y Gertrudis Rivalta. De avisos de Ocean asume la máxima expresada en la obra de Campos Pons que encabeza la muestra, identidad puede ser una tragedia y patria es una trampa. Es una exposición que subvierte los esencialismos, las ideas preestablecidas y los estereotipos en torno a la identidad latina, cubana y negra y lo hace desde un posicionamiento fluido y desde los archipiélagos. El segundo grupo expositivo con el que dialoga de Avisos de Ocean es el proyecto curatorial Queloides, al cual dedicaremos nuestra conversación en los próximos 30 minutos aproximadamente. En el ensayo de la historiadora del arte Tatiana Flores, un remapping no, Disturbing Categories, Remapping Knowledge, Flores reconoce, argumenta, que los artistas negros de ascendencia africana son generalmente o frecuentemente excluidos en exposiciones curadas desde una perspectiva latinoamericana. Y esto también lo hemos encontrado, o se hace evidente, al examinar las exposiciones internacionales que representan el arte cubano. Sin embargo, desde finales de los 90, curadores han explorado el tema de la raza y el racismo en Cuba, exponiendo la marginalización de los cuerpos racializados en el discurso del Estado-Nación. Es tomando la exposición Queloides como referencia, que es un placer para mí presentar la crítica y curadora cubana Susel Sánchez, que me acompaña en esta charla hoy. Susel Sánchez nació en La Habana y reside y trabaja en Madrid desde el 2004. Es licenciada en Historia del Arte por la Facultad de Artes y Letras de la Universidad de La Habana y tiene una maestría en Arte Contemporáneo y Cultura Visual en la Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. Desde 2012 forma parte del Grupo de Investigación Península, Procesos Coloniales y Prácticas Artísticas y Curatoriales establecido en el Museo Nacional Centro de Artes Reina Sofía. Sus intereses profesionales se orientan hacia la crítica de arte y la curaduría. Bienvenida, Susan. Hola, buenas tardes, buenos días. Eh, muchas gracias al Deide, a Cadi por la, por la invitación y de verdad que es un inmenso honor estar compartiendo con todas vosotras y poder hablar ¿no? de exposiciones que han sido tan importantes y que continúan siendo para el arte cubano contemporáneo y sobre todo para la sociedad civil cubana. Gracias, Suset. Yo quiero que comencemos nuestra charla hoy hablando un poco sobre qué es o qué fue el proyecto Queloides, y un poco que nos expliques cuáles fueron las condiciones que dieron origen a este proyecto. Sí, eh, bueno, Queloides eh, nació como una exposición eh, promovida por un grupo de, de artistas, pero sobre todo gracias al empeño de sus curadores iniciales, Alexis Esquivel, el artista Alexis Esquivel, y el curador Omar Pascual Castillo. El Queloides eh, surge como una exposición eh, que va a tomar por primera vez eh, y va a analizar por primera vez en Cuba eh, la presencia del racismo, la subsistencia del racismo en la sociedad cubana. Eh, teniendo en cuenta, por supuesto, eh, que hablar de racismo en Cuba durante la etapa revolucionaria había sido un tabú, dado que el gobierno revolucionario cuando llega al poder en 1959 decreta ¿no? la igualdad para todos sus ciudadanos y evidentemente eso silencia toda una serie de desigualdades, de inequidades, de... Eh, 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 discriminaciones que todavía se mantenía y que se mantienen a día de hoy. Que Loides va a ser la primera exposición que frontalmente, que abiertamente aborda el tema del racismo en Cuba y lo denuncia. Eh, la primera exposición. Cuba and denounces it. The first one, first exhibition is with a Congress of Anthropology, La Casa de África. And as I mentioned, Esquivel and Castillo, and along with a, a group of other artists that form part of that movement, and those concerns that 
about discrimination. We are talking about a society that's post-Soviet after it needs to open to new initiatives, new econ economy. So it begins to show the discrimination in a more Latin way. As Kiloides, we have other, like Kiloides, we have other expositions, ni musical, ni deportista, curated. Are Ribol, Cuban. And it functions parallel to Coloides. It happens the first year, 1997. And it will be amplified at a third exhibit, which would be the second part to this first part, Coloides, in 1999, the Desarrollo de Artes Visuales. So it is a conscience of Afro-conscience that expresses in the visual arts. And for the first time, we'll show it within Cuban institutions, public institutions. Never before this has happened with Coloides, Ni Musico, Ni Deportista, and the second part of Kiloides, 1999, opens conversations, uh, racial conversations in Cuba before then, this topic was silenced, and these two exhibits are very important. They begin speaking about racism and about the Afro-descendant people in Cuba. Thank you so much. And yes, you did uh, address the question that I had. Why is it important to take on this exhibitions in positions. This has been work that you have done during during a time that it was not well taken. It was critiqued. Could you share a bit more about when do you begin this research about Coloides? And can you share more about the process of beginning to rebuild these exhibitions and because we know that they are imagery documentation and it can be complicated can you tell us a bit more how that your process was well i think first of all we need to understand the economic political environment where this work was born in the 90s we are talking about uh, Cuba uh, going through a very special moment where there was lack of many resources, not only day to day, but also in the art world. And it was the mere fact to just obtain materials to do art or doc or any go to any other documents to refer to, we are we were dealing with lack of resources. There wasn't really much possibility to create big catalogs. If we think about historiography that focused on Cuban art history, there really at the moment wasn't any newspapers, um, art books that started coming out more in the late 90s, early 2000s. So we need to understand the moment, the impact of that. And as we mentioned previously, these are exhibits that were a milestone and provided a collective conscious in the art world. It is a collective understanding of how important this work was. The challenges that the island was facing made it difficult to have that critical apparatus. And there were writers, there were artists, curators that began getting closer to the phenomenon. And 
talk about how these work impacted them. But in the 90s, it was very few resources. And I think that due to the first exhibits, Coloides, the first part in 97, happened in La Casa de Africa, the first Congress of Anthropology. It is an institution that is out of the visual art environment. And this Centro Plásticas y Diseño work was done. And it's an organization that was within the art circuit, but it's a provincial organization less visible, at least during that time. And in 99, with the second colloids that happened in the Centro de Desarrollo Visuales, the Artes Plásticas, well, during that exposition, it was looked differently. It was more visibilized. And there are f factors. Maybe the mere fact that the first exhibition was done with the conscious of the arts, the curators, the Pascual, Arrialibo, and everyone that made that happen, there was a sense type of censorship that they were facing. Uh, such subject that they were bringing re about racism within Cuba could have been one of the motives why the exhibitions happen with within sectors that were interested in addressing this debate. But unfortunately, it was not amplified for the rest of society. Of course, the debate wasn't understood outside of the art world, maybe with the anthropology or other worlds, it was not addressed as you shared. Could you share more about who these artists were? The artists that included themselves in these exhibitions, how was the process of selection? Where did they come from? Well, as I said previously, I think that on one hand, Alexis Esquivel, one of the artists, but also curator of the first exhibit with Pascual Castillo, all of their work, their poetry, all of their work before as an individual artist was focused in analysis of the history of Cuba and the presence of the racial component. And it was, and with its identity of being black. So with Alexis, there was other artists in the 90s that identify as Afro-descendant that faced same, same issues. They were studying in the Instituto de Arte in San Alejandro there were debates and concerns that they would face day to day. We are speaking about a generation of artists that were born within the revolution. They were artists that they were seeing the revolutionary process, artists that were, that developed their skills in their, with, when, while they were studying. And in a way, they were prepared to demand for the rights that they were told that they'd had, but in, they were facing limits, barriers every day. In the 90s, everyone that lived in Cuba knew that it was a regular thing to see the police stop Black youth, Black women for no reason, for simply seeing the seeing them ra racially profiling them and having a stereotype towards black people so they felt empowered they felt empowered to demand for the rights the rights that they were told that they had the rights that they they not see institutionally and day to day. And so 
they were limited. I think that forms the transformation of uh, work like Loides had. It was a conversation. It was a debate in informal spaces, homes of the artists that became that then went out and were shown in these type of exhibitions. We're talking about artists with the trajectory that have been very important in the 90s. They've had exhibitions outside of Cuba, inside, institution, inside institutions where they addressed these topics, topics that were very alive in these institutions. And so they were having open conversations and institutions, institutions that were in direct contact with the public. Yes. One of the questions that we were talking about, and I find it very interesting that manifest in these exhibitions, is that not all the artists that were part of the exhibitions are necessarily artists that we would identify as Black or artists that, well, in one way, things are very complicated to be able to uh, identify, establish these uh, parameters. But there's also the question of who is welcome and who is not. They're beginning that conversation that is being seen from inclusion. And that there were what, not only Black artists were part of this conversation, but also non Black artists. And I find this to be very interesting. But also, I think, well, you have been talking about this about a little, but about the challenges that these exhibits faced in order for them to. Uh, be become, we're talking about artists that came out of universities. Can we talk about the difficulties about the exhibitions under the new regulations, the new laws? Like, the, do we hope to broaden the artists that are part of this exhibitions. Can you talk about who, what are those points of uh, conflicts that you see between one exhibition and another? Is there a process of, a, do you see a maturity process of this? How is it manifest? What are the changes that you have seen over time with these exhibitions? Yes, before I continue, I would like to uh, ask if we could continue seeing the images. Yes. Well, do you want me to go? Do you want me to go to the previous slides or continue forward? Continue, continue. Oh, okay, perfect. Well, to talk about the present and to talk about the repercussions that these exhibits have seen since the 90s to now, I think it's important to talk about a group of exhibitions that have been made in 2010. There were a couple of exhibitions that took the address the colloides and about race and ra took the subject of race and racism. And it'll be, it was curated by Alejandro de la Fuente, a Cuban historian based out of the US and also with the artist uh, Rodriguez who'd been um, participated in the previous three exhibits. These exhibits should also be understood perhaps in that whole climate of uh, tension between US and Cuba or rapprochement during the Obama administration. And it featured the traveling of these exhibits from Cuba to different locations in the US. In 2010, for example, there was a, a showing of Keloides, Keloides um, in which several artists from 
the US, went to Cuba. Uh, can we share the images, please? Can someone confirm if we are seeing uh, any of the images, please? I will continue. I'll keep talking in the meantime. Um, one of the issues is precisely the fact that the artists who were in the diaspora were able to be in Cuba, were able to come to those exhibits to participate. For example, like Marta Maria Perez, Maria Magdalena Campos, like Armando Mariño, who were able to be at these new exhibits. And on the other hand, we should also mention facts that still remain and that keep uh, impeding the possibility of opening up debate. Um, while we have these exhibits, there should be a whole program a part of the public where this this is uh, more accessible and it reaches more. In the first Keloids exhibit, um, Alejandro de la Fuente, its curator, was not able to enter Cuba, but also we have other exhibits by Alejandro de la Fuente who rescued the work of a group that had been silenced um, by Cuban historiography, like the Antillano group from the 70s and 80s, which is very tied to Wilfredo Lam, Manuel Bendive, and other artists from that generation. And they were silenced precisely because of the component of African heritage and the magical religious component in their practice. So there was interesting work done in um, policies of archiving, which is very important to recognize and to highlight that the agency of these people in Cuba. It wasn't an official debate, a uh, debate for the construction of this identity in visual arts, but simply they had been pushed aside. They had been marginalized for not being a central part of their ideas or for their ideas not being part of the central ideas in politics, but also for an, about an interest on, in the vanguardism in Cuban art, which wanted to drive forward uh, or to, wanted to favor the vanguardist practices. So when we consider the possibility of uh, having these exhibits in the present uh, with uh, dealing with uh, racial themes, I'm thinking about how these artists are all artists who are coming back from or are all graduates of the Cuban arts education pro, um, system. So when we talk about Decree 349, we're talking about a decree that in 2018, the Ministry of Culture in Cuba established through a constitutional referendum to restrict the right or the access of people who haven't graduated from art schools um, in their ability to gain access to institutions that where they can exhibit or practice their art. It's really a measure to restrict free expression. For example, uh, Luis Manuel Tero Alcantara, who's a self-taught artist and was uh, is currently imprisoned for participating in protests last year during the popular revolts in Cuba. And precisely one of the arguments given to continuously surveil him is that he has not graduated from an art school that he's self-taught, which is absolutely absurd. 
evidently the issue of racism is very sensitive in Cuba still, it remains so, especially under the current conditions where Cuba is opening up to a neoliberal transition system where we see more evidence of private places, private spaces open to the public, where there's a sign that says, we reserve the right to admit people. And that is always going to be linked to the different um, restrictions and limitations. So therefore, Afro-descendant people are in a more vulnerable situation faced with all these new restrictions that have cropped up with this supposed, with this alleged prolonged transition, which is happening in the economy of Cuba. Under those circumstances, once again, the racial debate, not just in the field of the arts, but in Cuban society overall, is more relevant. It's more urgent and necessary. And that's where these voices may find not just uh, barriers or censorship, but also different ways of being coerced, of being punished, simply for wanting to express and wanting to portray a situation that is being lived daily. So said we were talking about how the during the Obama administration, there was an increase in uh, exhibits that somehow addressed racism in Cuba and that somehow they functioned to generate this idea of change that was wanted about what was going on on the island to nurture this rapprochement between the two countries. So during that period, we see in the National Fine Arts Museum, there was an exhibit that creates a, an air of optimism with regard to recognizing the racial problematic on the island. It's an interesting question because I think above all, these exhibits take place in a setting of that's ambiguous. On the one hand, we must celebrate an exhibit about Afro-Cuban art within the National Museum of Fine Arts. We're talking about the foremost institution for the nation's artistic patrimony and cultural patrimony. We're talking about an institution that's directly under the control of the cabinet. So it will follow the policies that come directly from the Cuban government. So if we're taking that into the context of looking at the black subject, at the Afro-descendant subjects, we must celebrate that. On the other hand, what is it telling us? The fact that there is an exhibit funded from a private collection from a foreign investor. So that entrance of a private collection into a public national museum, it should also make us suspicious and also question what are the power and the economic relations that are taking place within the field of Cuban art. That's why I say it's ambiguous. Celebrate, absolutely celebrate that an institution like the National Fine Arts Museum, because we know that exhibits such as this had occurred in other spaces, never in this one before. So it's important that this took place. But in 2019, the National Fine Arts Museum, precisely when the Biennale in Havana happened, it shows other exhibits that try to rethink and reorganize the funds of the collection about the modern idea of the, the construction of the Cuban nation. And in that set of exhibits, which were about five of them, there was one called Nothing Personal, 
and another one called Isla de Azúcar, Sugar Island, that tried to structure that colonial discourse in the of colonialism discourse in the building of the Cuban nation and looking at the sugar uh, production as the keystone of Cuban economy. And that, of course, pointed to black subjects and black bodies as those who had sustained that colonial violence. These exhibits are not just uh, happening um, for no reason. This has to do with that opening and that reaching between Cuba and the US during the Obama administration for the first time, and also had to do with shedding light and all that intellectual thought, all that cultural production, all that agency that has to do with the power of the African diaspora and its discourses in the Caribbean and in Cuba. But evidently, I think that we should take everything um, with uh, caution and to not get too comfortable, but definitely celebrate that in a place like the Cuban National Fine Arts Museum should show and amplify these voices, these ideas, but also looking at how we can use this and we can use this about to criticize the racism that still persists in these. Yes, we must celebrate visibility, but we must consider the limits within which this visibility happens. Absolutely. Um, we're running out of time. We have two and a half minutes. What do you think are the challenges to curators who are dealing with the the issues of uh, race in Cuba? What are the issues and how do we face them? Well, to begin with, Aldele, I always like to say, obviously, I am a white Cuban woman migrant within the context of the Spanish state when speaking of these issues, I like to position myself so you can see where I'm speaking from. I think it's important, and this was one of the critiques I uh, had about the K. Lloyd's exhibit from 2010, was that there was no generational baton passing. These artists were not included, Carlos Martiel, Miguel Monsalves, Javier Castro, and others who are working, who are producing a body of work that's very important, reflecting specifically on racial violence in Cuba. That passing of the generational baton uh, has not happened. That's why it's important to look, to look to those other positions. There are even artists who are doing a type of work and a type of activism that's different from with different languages, languages that are more aimed at the urban public Cuban space. So for me, the possibility that we have to access and to amplify racial debates within artistic institutions, museums, art centers, etc. One of our great responsibilities is to know that we're not exempt from the falsification of tendencies of the market. This is something that we should be very clear about and we should remain very vigilant. We have to be very mindful of the types of operations that we carry out, um, our practices, our imaginaries, when we bring these to the exhibit halls. We don't have to we have to be very conscious of what conditions we're setting, what the institutions are, what is the colonial past that these institutions have where we're dial that we're dialoguing with, and how we are aiding or creating a space for, in which to, for the Black bodies to enter. That's a very important piece for a curatorial practice and with regards to activism. Uta. Thank you very much. I'll pass it to Grace now, and thank you very much for this conversation.
Suzette and Aldeni, thank you both for that fascinating discussion. And, and then to see the work and the images as you talked was um, really important and impactful. Um, it's my honor to bring our respondent into the conversation. Please welcome Hasmeen Chavez Helm and a little bit about Hasmeen. She's the current CADI Curatorial Fellow and recently became the program administrator for the Latin X project at NYU, uh, another initiative that uh, is wonderful and doing important work. Hasmeen is also the founder of the Digital Humanities Project Recuerdos de Nicaragua, which archives the material culture of the Afro and indigenous communities in the Mosquito Coast of Nicaragua and Honduras. Hasmin, welcome. You're muted. You're muted, Hasmin. <laughs> Gracias, lo siento. <laughs> Gracias, Grace. Thank you, I'm sorry. Thank you, Grace. Thank you, Alde and Suced for this conversation, for the exhibition and for all of your ideas. I apologize, Spanish is not my first language. I appreciate your ability. I have three questions and okay. The first question, la primer pregunta. The first question. Do you think the theory can can be applied in the continents archipelagica? Yes. In my practice, in my curatorial practice, I would say from the last year, I define my practice. Well, as a matter of fact, this conversation that we're having right now focused in the um, curatorial archivist is part of my work. I recognize my presence in the space of Miami. I talk a lot about Miami being a border area, an intersection between Americas and how addressing it from a border perspective, I can address co colonization and art history in general, but particularly the history of photography, which is my area of work. As part of my research, I took the archipelago theme and how it, our history has been documented, not necessarily by the people that have been legitimized by spaces that legitimize. I, I know that from a perspective, our archipelago, how the Latinx art allows us to be able to understand and see the colonial legacy. It allows us to see us the overlapping sections of time. Many of our countries, from our countries that we come and see those multiple diasporic entities that can be seen, for example, Juana Valdez, an artist that has a piece that I believe illustrates very well this notion of having multiple identities where she does an analysis of her DNA, her mother's DNA. And after this, she sees these blueprints, these prints that come from different areas from Asia, Africa, Latin America. So how do you begin to include all these complexities that cannot only been reduced to being only Latino or only black or only 
sí. such an entity. But how do we understand all these complexities of identities? I see it from a notion, a perspective from Archie. Archipelago helps us understand that complexity. Muchas gracias. Tengo um, un otro, un otra pregunta. I have another question. Yes. Have you noticed differences in the work of artists born in Cuba in comparison with artists with Cuban descendants? And if you see those differences, what are they? Well, I think about talking about differences and perhaps Suset can contribute to this conversation, but differences between the artists that whether they live in Cuba, born in Cuba, and artists that immigrated to this country, uh, well, there's differences like we can see in different types of art, uh, artists, I don't really like categorizing this type of tendencies that classify artists under one group or and which can determine certain presumptions because if you are uh, such as if you are a woman artist you're going to create some type of specific art i don't really like categorizing them but I would say that one of the biggest challenges was to find artists that openly, or in this case, women that openly would address the racial issues. In the case of Cuba, there is political propaganda imagery, which we grew up with, which we were educated, establishes the problems of racism, misogynist, it gives this idea that we have overcome this. And so there are a lot of artists that do not like uh, being part of exhibits that address in a way, in English, well, we would say that they're categorized in a, they don't like being categorized in a certain, under one certain view. When I was research, researching for Cuban photographers, there were many Cuban photographers that did not want to be included because they did not want to be um, only seen as women Cuban photographers and categorized in such a way. And so the, there has been a huge influence in Cuba and there is more interest in addressing this topic. Places that have now interest in access to the internet mm -hmm. can have a different perspective, if I could just say it that way. Sí, gracias. Okay. Yes, thank you. Un otro. Otra. One more, <laughs> one more question. Um, un momento. One moment. How do you think as academic, academics, curators, artists can minimize the trauma uh, for minimize the trauma for people that are Afro-descendant, how we can work for spaces to be more safe. Well, when I was speaking to Suset, I asked about the education programs. I would say in the last two years, we are being more conscious about the work that we do directly impacts the community. Perhaps now we're more aware of who our audiences are and how we can really reach them with, through our work. I think it's important to 
to go and find information from the first source to get to know what are the needs that the public needs and get involved not only in a passive way through exhibits, but how can we be active agents in raising awareness? I would like, well, I don't, I can't, I will try to answer more about the conscious that we follow when we do our practice. I think it's very important. This is why I insisted in a place to where we are speaking from, to being aware of all of our privileges that it means to, to be in the contemporary art world and uh, that dialogues that speak about culture, uh, places where there is a structure, and, and also the way that this awareness is shared in the institutions that our practice happens. So as a curator, or at least I always like to speak in the eye, it is very important to, to know that our practice is assuming that medium, that context where we live in, that is a practice where the local finds a voice and that all those global issues and how this information is shared has certain particularities. For me, when I work with images or voices, or when I am in a dialogue with Af people that identify as Afro-descendant, it's important for me not to forget the term racism. It is important because it is a word that reflects a society. And unfortunately, we still need to make a lot of awareness uh, when we, especially when we see that the right wins a lot of space, institutions and governments. So working with images in addition for it to be in the medium in which everyone, almost everyone communicates, such as social media. I think the labor that we do with images where there are determined bodies that face consistent violence and they become the center of the conversation, it is important for us to use our voice. And in our conversations, and social media is always trying to visibilize and share own violent, structural and systemic violence. I think our work with images should show, should show that we should bring conscious. And we still live in a place where there are bodies that face violence due to racism. I think it is important for us to have a fundamental responsibility with that. Sí, yo estoy de acuerdo y gracias por su, su respuestas, um, Suzette. Y, I'm in agreement. Uh, thank you uh, for your answers. Suzette. Yes, I agree. And thank you for your responses, Suzette and Aldeide. Thank you, Hasmin. Thank you so much, Hasmin. You um, you show us why we're so proud to call you one of our Caddy Curatorial Fellows. Those questions were important, and I particularly um, appreciated the question about trauma and not doing more harm when we talk about this work. A really important and meaningful question. And thank you, Aldeia and Suzette, for responding to it so thoughtfully. In turn. Um, we're going to move to hearing from our audience, and we thank you all for being here with us and for gathering with us. We have, please again, pop your questions in the Q&A field. We have a question from Newt Paul, and I believe this is uh, largely for Suzette. And uh, 
Newt is asking if you can share your thoughts on the Grupo Antiliano project and how it contributed to the exhibition in 1997. Perdón, es que estaba leyendo. Eh, no, eh, perdón, quiero leer porque veo en las preguntas y respuestas que... Mm, uh, excuse me, I was reading because I see Elio Rodriguez is, read, is um, participating here, who is a curator along with uh, Alejandro de la Fuente of the Keloides, Keloides in 2010, and also in the homage exhibit to... Um, the Grupo Antellano. And he comments that with the, in the case of new artists, new generations, we tried to include, they were tried to include them in the exhibit, but it wasn't possible. Specifically, they were trying to work with Carlos Martiel and Javier Castro. And I, I got a little lost because I didn't hear the question well. Si puedes compartir tus pensamientos sobre cómo el Grupo Antillano contribuyó con la exhibición de 1997. Bueno, con la, con la exposición de 1997 no creo que haya habido particularmente una... Well, with the uh, 1997 exhibit, I don't think there was a particularly a collaboration, but there were definitely many influences. If I'm memory doesn't fail, one of the works from Alexei Esquivel in the 1999 exhibit was making a type of appropriation of an emblematic work by Manuel Mendive, which is the slave ship, talking about these, more or less about these new migration processes that the uh, African diaspora is facing once already transplanted into a space they have to once again face migration to a new space but in in that case um there was a very close collaboration from the point of view of rescuing all that history which was somehow buried the history was there but evidently over practically two, three decades, it was silenced. On the one hand, because evidently from the decade of the 70s, precisely, where Cuba's uh, taking on uh, an aesthetic that's uh, ruled by socialist realism, looking to the Soviet Union as their canon for cultural propaganda, the Grupo Antillano was precisely looking to the archipelagos, was looking at the Caribbean, to that concept of Antillanilat, right, to Antillism um, that we have. And so we're evidently rescuing practices that have to do with memory, but a memory where the religious memories of history, of uh, historical memories of uh, African religious practices are very key as well. So in the concept, in a context where a society, the concept of a society that's lay, that's realist is the norm, um, for them to be holding these practices was in conflict with the cultural politics or policy. So it's, uh, it's a historical piece of Cuban art, and it's something that has to be rescued and put on the front page. And this is an important exhibit because it shows a very broad, very large collective of artists of all languages and all media. But that policy of archiving that also comes forth that brings to that exhibit, that comes to that exhibit, the production of a wonderful catalog with documentation, with photography, with archives, um, documenting the exhibits. It's very important because that work shows that that will to, to work on historiography with somebody like Alejandro de la Fuente. So that today these artists who are quite advanced in age will be able to say and see that they hold an important place in that cultural history. 
thank you very much. Thank you, Suzette. And I know you started to read Elio's question, um, but Aldete and Suzette, I don't know if you wanted to address it more fully. And if you do, Aldete, I'll, I'll ask you to um, read it in Spanish. Yeah, um, Suzette already mentioned, mentioned th there are no questions, they are just comments. Okay. And yeah, Suzette mentioned them. Um, so I think we are fine. Okay. I have a question for uh, you, Aldede. So as I was listening to uh, both of you talk about sort of the state of curating Cuban art, both within Cuba and um, beyond Cuba's borders in the diaspora, the words that kept coming up, you know, were taboo and sensitive and limitations and censorship. And um, it really struck me to hear you say, Aldede, that even in prepping for this project, The Abyss of the Ocean for Caddy, that there might have been some uh, artists and photographers who didn't want to be identified with that framework as Cuban women photographers. And I wanted to ask you if they didn't want to be framed that way, what what, how did they want to be framed? What were some of the conversations that they were sharing with you about how they would like to be thought of and shown and, and conversed with? Yeah, that was not with this exhibition. That was, um, I was referring to the project catalog of Cuban women photographers. When I started that project in 2013, that was a moment in which when it was very hard to speak about topics such as feminism or even um, studying where well, the catalog of Cuban women photographers was the first project that um, comprehensively proposed this uh, rewriting or this um, um, process of bringing to light the women who have contributed to the history of um, Cuban photography from a feminist perspective. So for many artists, it was, uh, it was at that point um, something new and something in which they don't necessarily wanted to be involved because, uh, and that not only happened in the Cuban context, I mean, uh, when we learn or when we read um, some of the writings of Abigail Solomon Goudot, she speaks about these, um, the, the dangers of, uh, of the ghettoization of how some artists fear um, uh, to be to be include have you know they 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 fear to have to be include in certain exhibitions in which they are only um, identified for um, um, considering their identity as women or as black or um, that's something that's a perspective that I have found uh, not only you know several times that I respect that position but you know I think that. Uh, with the pass of the time, that position has changed a little bit. I mean, I am not finding that answer um, anymore, like in the recent years. Um, and I think that is because education, um, there was a lot of prejudice, uh, and specifically in the Q1 context about what feminists could be. And, uh, and right now is, uh, yeah, I think that is more easy for everyone to identify or to understand uh, what are the real um, proclaims of uh, movement, such as, um, when, such as feminists or being in an exhibition that uh, centers this perspective. Thank you. I have a final question for both of you before we close out and unless we, we get another question pop into the Q&A. And I wanna thank you both Suzette and Aldere for laying out the challenges of what it means to commit to this work, to curating Cuban art. Um, and I wanted to ask you for those of us who are thinking about what the futures and the possibilities of this field are, um, if you can share with us uh, some of the opportunities and the possibilities that you are encouraged by, by other curatorial projects that, that have been happening, by other curators working on this particular body of work. What are some things that you are encouraged by that we should take note of? You want to respond to Seth first? <laughs> well, uh, thinking on, I was speaking with Suzette that, um, 
were after organizing the abyss of the ocean, but also, I mean, if this would have been, um, I thinking right now on that, like a physical exhibition, I told to say that I would love, I would have loved to include like um, documentary material related with these other exhibitions, because I think that uh, chronology or this history or that legacy needs to be expressed in a very conscious way. And people need to be aware of that. We believe, and I think that's something that I share with you said in the possibility of tell a history of art from the perspective of the exhibitions. And uh, I think I always, and this is something that I try to make with the abyss of the ocean. I mean, this idea of exhibitions inside exhibitions and uh, establishing like this dialogue with building a feminist archive, but also with Keloides. And, and I think that thinking on what kind of ideal exhibition on this topic I will see in the future for someone to, who wanted to make it, I, I consider it's very important to include to interdisciplinary in our approach and include how other movement, for example, in literature, in music, uh, for example, there is a big movement of hip hop who uh, in Cuba have been, uh, you know, addressing these topics. And I think that an, an exhibition that compiles or includes all of this manifestation could be awesome. I mean, I look forward with excitement and ready to that. And that's something that I, for sure, I, I, I encourage or an approach uh, that I would like to see um, regarding this topic. Um, yo creo que uno de, lo, de los retos fundamentales, ¿no? I think that one of the key challenges that I, at least I think about, and it's uh, related to Aldeide um, was explaining, is that from my position as an art historian, how to effectively contribute to building a history that turns the point of view of how that art history has been lived and writing in Cuba and contemporary art, which doesn't just have to do with modern art, but with art. art. I can't think of a, his, a story of or a history of contemporary art in Cuba without it being connected and in the context of the Cuban reality and without also looking at what happened before 59 and since 59, but especially with this new Cuban society with all its problems that's reconfiguring in such a tense way and that effectively it will face an uncertain and very convulsive future. And evidently the, the issues, the topics that have to do with different agencies about different bodies and different subjects will become ever more urgent. So it's important for me to think from that space of how to rebuild other possible narratives and to give body to these other histories, whether it's about the exhibits that have left on that sidebar, that marginalized space of the greater art histories that have been have come out of Cuba, but also thinking about the different contexts in which Cuban art is being thought about today. In this sense, there tends to be a capacity for power to erase or annul the voices in the diaspora because of that concept of unity and nationalism. And frankly, effectively, we cannot think of Cuban art today without including thinking about all its diasporas and of that fluidity from within to without Cuba and vice versa. So to think about all these, as Aldeida was saying about these archipelago, archipelagos um, and to question that closed character of the island. And that's a, a curatorial practice that's affected, but also 
but also curatorial practice also creates a historiographic context which serves to portray the future but also to project the dangers that are waiting for us in the future thank you Suzette. we've reached the end of our time together and um, before we close out i would like to say thank you to all of you um, particularly our behind the scenes team, Kat Lazo, our producer, and Aliyah Oliver, our public program associate, and of course our interpreters, Sayuri Gomez and Luis Lopez. And to share with us closing remarks before we depart with you, I'd like to welcome into the Zoom room our wonderful director of programs of Caddy, Sabine Bryson. Welcome, Sabine. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, as I echo Gray's special thanks to the Cadi staff, curators, artists, and partners for putting this exhibit and event together. It is important to highlight our pan-Caribbean, our pan-African interconnections, our shared histories, as in migration, identity, race, and social justice, and have these critical conversations. So in the spirit of Sankofa, our Akan ancestors believed that the past serves as a guide for planning the future. So here at Kadi, we center ourselves in the legacy, power, and beauty of the African diaspora. And we're excited for what the future holds as a sustainable global cultural institution. It's been a pleasure to have been part of this conversation and thank you so much again.